My name is Paco. I come from a security consultancy called Sigital. This is Noel. Uh, that's the, the Twitter handle. Any of you out there on the interwebs, hello there. I know you're watching this live streaming. Thank you very much. We love you too. This is us, right? So I, I work at a, a security consultancy and we help people make software secure. I've been doing security for a nice long time. Um, I also uh, written a couple of books, and if you've seen those folks, they're CISSP or CSSLP. Yeah, I have those certifications. I also write the exam questions for those exams. So you know, if you had to sit through that exam and you went home thinking, oh, it. well, yep, sorry, that was <laughs> there's a good chance one of those was mine. Uh, Noel, hey, my name's Noel. Um, I've been doing security for pretty much 17 years. Um, of which uh, 15 or so have been sort of building sort of websites. So that's more from like a, an application and a software sort of security perspective. Um, recovering security consultant. So um, I'm now considered one of the good guys. So I, I work for a sort of an in-house uh, organization and uh, I'm part of a team that have found um, some of the coolest uh, zero day sort of exploits and software that uh, you've never heard of. So uh, we'll, we'll come on to those reasons why shortly. Sure. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to get the clicker to click. There we go. So all of you are familiar with the sort of, you know, seven layer, you know, reference model for, for networks, right? We're all familiar with the, these seven layers. Um, you may not be aware that there are actually three more layers up there, right? You have the financial, the legal, and, and the political layer. And actually over lunch, somebody mentioned, you know, there's one layer above that, the religious layer. Um, you know, so, so we're going to talk about layer nine, right? We're going to talk about getting folks at the legal and procurement level to help us with our security. So we're not doing, you know, layer one or layer two or layer three controls. We're doing layer nine. It's going to look like this. You know, we're going to give you some, some history, some of the, the journey, like how do we get here? And then we'll talk about what do we do? You know, how does it work? And, and maybe some lessons learned, because you, know, you, you never get everything exactly right. And then finally, we'll end up with some points on how you could you probably leverage some of the same things that we're doing, either at your organization or if you're a consultant like me at some of your clients. But first, I want to tell you a fairy tale. This is the fairy tale that we tell ourselves about how software gets purchased, right? Once upon a time, the king needed software, and he wanted the best software. This would be the software for the king, right? So the king put out a great tournament, and all the software vendors from across the land, they came out, and they jousted, and they did their competition. And the king chose the best software there was, and it was good, and they were faithful servants of the king, and they got the treasure, and everybody lived happily ever after. Right? This is the, the fairy tale that we tell ourselves about how software gets bought by a large enterprise. We want to get the best, we want to get a good price, so we have a, a procurement process. And that process, you know, leads us to getting the best software at the best price. There's a famous quote, actually, of uh, one of the um, Apollo 11 astronauts you know, that went to the moon, and they said, what were you thinking right before the, you know, the rocket lifted off? And he said, I'm, I'm trusting my life to a massive rocket built by the lowest bidder. So uh, it's that lowest bidder and, and, and this whole procurement process that we're, we're trying to talk about. In reality, of course, it's a little bit messier. right? In reality, somebody in the business needs something. And that's normal. And so they enter this, this kind of procurement process. And the procurement process, you know, first we have to pick a vendor. And so there's, you know, all these things that go into that whole vendor selection process. You might have to do a proof of concept, or there might be a demo, or there might be, you know, the, the whole sales process. And then you enter into like contract negotiations where they say, we want more money, and we say, we want to pay less, and they say, we want you to pay more, and we say, we want to pay less. And, you know, the, the real issue with this whole process is that every time we've tried to inject security into this process, we tend to sort of bounce off, right? Like, you know what, how about, how about we get the security guys to come in and, and help you with your need? No, I don't want to talk to you. Go away. 
well, you know, you're, you're going to pick a vendor. Can we help you with the, the vendors? Because some of these guys are better than others. No, go away. And so then, of course, we do get called, right? They do the vendor selection process. They negotiate the contract. This thing shows up. And they're like, hey, security, could you guys go secure that now? <sighs> you know, so that's, that's really not the way we want to get engaged. Especially if you're dealing with, you know, developers, people who are going to build software for you. You don't want to get into this three-year process where they're going to build a website and, and you know, there's major milestones every year for three years. And at the end of year three, they come to you and they say, right, so it's, uh, it's done now. You guys want to look? And that's the problem that we're trying to, to solve, right? And I, some of you may have seen this on Twitter. I tweeted this comic out a couple times and... Um, this is, the, this is what happens, right? All right, I'm the vendor. Hey, the software is ready to go. You guys want to test it? Okie dokie. Here we go. Hack, hack, hack. Ninja, ninja, ninja. Oh, look at that. The software is all busted. You know, and, and then the, the vendor says to the procurement folks, well, you didn't tell me it had to be secure. You know, you just told me you wanted the software, so we gave you the software. Where in the contract does it say this is supposed to be secure? Now, some of you may sit there and think, you know, no, that really doesn't happen. But, of course, part of the reason I'm standing on stage is because not only does it happen, but it has happened many times to the same enterprise. And when I posted that comic, I had several people contact me, you know, by email and Twitter and stuff saying, dude, I've been in the room when that conversation happened. So this is actually happening quite a bit. Vendors produce some crappy software, and you say, well, that's crap. And they say, well, where in the contract does it say it's not supposed to be crap? The, uh, one of my clients makes uh, slot machines, and that's kind of fun. I mean, you, you go, to the, go to your desk and like, excuse me, but you didn't put a slot machine at my desk? How am I supposed to do my job? Oh, here you go. And uh, we were working on the, the uh, they outsourced the development of the operating system that runs on the slot machine. They outsourced it to a, a vendor, and they wrote an 80-page specification for the development of this new slot machine platform. And on the eight, in, in 80 pages of spec, there was one and a half pages on software, right? So there was like 60, 70 pages about electrical discharge and physical, you know, weight, height, shape, and where the speakers were going to be in the box. And, and there was like a page and a half on, you know, and the software will comply with Nevada gaming regulations and it will be a slot machine. And that's kind of all they said about the software. And so sure enough, as the drops started coming in, the software's coming in, and they go to uh, they go to build it in house. I'm like, we can't make this thing build. There's no comments in the code. You didn't give us any design docs. We don't even know how this thing is put together. And the vendor pushed back. I'm like, what? Where, where does it say we're supposed to comment the code? Where does it say we're supposed to give you design docs? Where does it say? And you know, the fact is, it said nothing. And so then they were you know, they were stuck paying millions of dollars to basically hire those people to document what they had done which is just a terrible position to be in. So that's the problem we're going to solve, or at least work on. And Noel's going to give you some of the details about how, kind of how we got here and, and the situation he was facing when we uh, started off. Right, so um, I kind of fell into this about sort of three years ago when I, um, I was at a, a former organization. And uh, sort of being the new guy and trying to be sort of helpful, um, one of the things that sort of came across my lap was um, a DNS change. And um, being the new guy and trying to sort of, you know, make new friends and all this kind of stuff, uh, I thought I'd sort of assist with this DNS change. And um, the upshot was that uh, the organization I was at was looking to launch a... Um, a new website, and um, uh, part of this DNS change was literally a little section for security that, in effect, says, has this thing been sort of pen tested and has this undergone some kind of due diligence? And the thing was, was that this site was going live like on Tuesday, so we literally had like three or four days in advance um, to test this site. Now. I don't know about you know some of you guys, but um, if you're at an organisation and you outsource like pen testing services, you've got sort of lead time to literally book resources. Resources come in, 
a scoping exercise needs to take place. And then um, as part of that uh, scoping exercise, uh, you know, there's, there's a, you know, a proposal that talks about um, how the site's going to be tested and how long, it, how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost. And before you know it, a week's passed. So from, from, a, you know, from a security perspective, we were sort of arriving pretty much late in the day, um, if at all. And, um, you know, a, a, another thing was that um, uh, we were sort of testing sites at, at the 11th hour, and we were finding fundamental flaws in these websites. And um, the only way that we, we, we could actually sort of manage and sort of track these sites going live was through sort of these DNS changes and requests coming through. So we asked a question, and it's like, well, what happens if we create a website and we don't follow our standard domain name sort of registration? So for instance, if we were to go out and build a website and create our own sort of domain name, so using the likes of Multigo and Shodan, what we discovered was in addition to like the 50 external websites that we had following our, our own sort of name registration rules, we had another 50 more. So security fundamentally was broken. So we were finding sites and breaking them. And um, when you're sort of breaking bad news to a business that you know, ultimately wants to put something live, and you're saying, you know what, this is fundamentally broken. Who are the guys that gets blamed? And ultimately, it was security. So security are holding up this piece of work or this program of work from going live. Uh, not uh, the actual reason in that we've gone out to a vendor, the vendor has written some shy code, and as a result of that, we've come in and, and we've, in effect, sort of broken it. So security, ultimately broken, so, um, we're arriving late, and in some instance, we weren't aware of like web services and third-party applications that had been written and built for us that were actually live on the internet with basic security 101 flaws. So this is like basic cross-site scripting, basic SQL injection flaws. Who's the picture? So, um, so the, the picture is uh, Delamitri, um, and they were a band you know, from, from Scotland in sort of the the late 80s, and that their sort of groundbreaking track was the last to know. And uh, it kind of felt that security was always the last to know, um, you know, in terms of stuff going live. So that kind of sort of drove a requirement for change, but where? So if you're outsourcing a piece of work and actually internal IT and internal security teams actually don't get to touch them, it kind of sort of focused our attention to say, you know what, we need to get into this earlier, perhaps at, you know, say a con contractual um, level. And the key thing was, we, you know, we had a, you know, a set number of goals, so we didn't want to be sort of the, the security department that said no all the time. What we wanted to do was we wanted to affect change. We wanted to enable the business. So if the business wants a website to go live, will help them get that website live. And ultimately, it's the business that, that, in effect, are paying our salaries. So if you're saying no to the business, and these guys need something that's going to generate money to then sort of pay your salary, it's you know, fairly important to, to actually sort of enable that business to do its job. Um, the other thing was that um, we wanted to add value. And, um, what we wanted to do was, was, you know, as part of that sort of value add, we didn't want to do something just for the sake of it. So we didn't want to sort of devolve, it, you know, into security just being a tick box exercise. We wanted to, to actually make a difference. So the first thing we wanted to do was, let's get involved in the contracts. And there's a slight issue here. You've got a thousand vendors, and you've got to, you know, so, you know, I'm part of an organization currently where we have like 75, 80,000 sort of employees, and you're dealing with a thousand vendors. Now, within an organization of that size, you're gonna have different business units, and these business units are gonna have their own funding and their own budget, so if they need a website or a marketing site to go live, why do they need to speak to sort of internal IT? It's easier for them to pick up the phone 
and listen to some marketing blurb from you know, a so-called software as a service provider to go away and build them a website. So we had the issue of business units going off and doing their own thing, and we wanted to support them in, in sort of doing that. We also had a 1,000 vendors with existing contracts. We also had a small security team. So you know, keeping in mind the goals, how can you then affect change? If you're a security department of like four or five guys to 10 guys, how can you, you know, ultimately affect change across a thousand sort of ven vendors? The other thing was that we also had sort of contracts in place. So, you know, if you want a, a vendor to change your contracts, who in the right mind would say, you know what, we've got an existing contract and security have stepped in and they want us to implement these changes, whether that's like carrying out something like static code analysis, which is ultimately going to be at more cost sort of, you know, to the vendor. So we, we had the issue that we've got um, live contracts that changes are possible, but ultimately you couldn't do, you know, something immediately. And um, um, something that, you know, again, something that we, we, in effect, had to sort of renegotiate sort of later. So looking through the contracts, security was already in place. But it was, you know, we do things very well from like a, a security perspective, particularly around sort of uh, data security and privacy, data protection and liability in the event of things going wrong. But the issue was, you know, we had like people that were sort of building websites and we were telling them the contract what they could and couldn't do on our network. So we had these like contracts with security sort of requirements within them that kind of sort of evolved and morphed over time. So we had stuff in there that wasn't actually particularly effective. The second thing that you know, was also um, an issue for us was that when you're going out to sort of procure a website, um, the assumption is that security is proportionate to the cost of that website. So if you've got a website that, in effect, has cost 20 or 30,000 pounds to, to sort of uh, develop and build, and that ultimately takes 50 million pounds, uh, you know, the, the assumption is from the business is to say, well, we've spent 30 grand to build this thing, so from a security perspective, we probably want to spend only sort of four or five grand. So, you know, th 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 you know we, we had sort of battles sort of, um, internally to sort of change culture and change the ethos to say actually, even though that this thing costs 30 grand, actually you may want to spend 30 grand to protect the 50 million pounds that you're going to get from it. And, um, you know, I've, I've seen this sort of time and time again. So a few years ago, a company I was, at was launching a marketing website in China. So they went out and sort of outsourced, you know, sourced a local sort of Chinese provider who built the you know, a website for us for somewhere in the region of like a thousand US dollars. And within like a few minutes of this being sort of live and up, uh, it was hacked and it was, uh, from memory, it was like tagged by a, a Turkish uh, sort of hacking sort of organization that actually used sort of default credentials to go into the administration pages to then sort of upload their own code and upload their own sort of images. So the thing was is that um, if you're spending a thousand US dollars on a website, you're going to get pushback from the business to say, why would I want to spend four or five grand doing security work on a website that's ultimately cost me a thousand dollars? So, what we needed was um, a number of things. So, we needed something to scale. So, if you've got a thousand contracts with existing suppliers, how can you then sort of affect change across those thousand vendors? We also needed the, the requirement that actually we, we needed to empower to actually sort of help us there. Um, and we also needed the security ch uh, team to change as well. So we wanted to make the theory practical. So I don't know how many people get sort of webs, you know, pen test reports and you see an alert one is a screenshot. You know, an alert one to a business user is going to mean jack shit. Ultimately, you know, where you see an alert one, well, that's cross-site scripting, you know, vulnerability. Well, who cares? And if you're a business you use it, you're going to say who cares. So one of the things that we needed to do was literally to affect change, but make the issues that we found previously 
more relevant. So if there was a cross-site scripting exploit, we'd be looking for sort of rendering some stupid or some political sort of comments to actually get the business to think, actually, we've got an issue here, and okay, it may be SQL injection or cross-site scripting, but I remember seeing some personal data, or I'll remember you know, uh, seeing a stupid image. If I could, so, if I could jump in, the, the thing about like unattended operation, right? We're gonna have a thousand contracts potentially in a year, or 500 contracts in a year, four guys doing it. Procurement's got to be able to do some of this stuff on their own. They, they, we can't get involved in each and every single one of them. That's the, the sort of unattended operation. We got to put stuff in place where even if the security guys aren't there at the table, well, some some good things will still happen. So. Yeah, I mean, f further to sort of Paco's comment there, so what we wanted to do was to make security understandable. So that's like articulating security into, you know, in effect, in, in, in real business terms. So a thousand contracts, we just split people up. So if you're providing hosting for us on our behalf, we'll define a whole bunch of requirements around hosting. If you're writing bespoke software for us, then we'll define a bunch of requirements for you from a software development perspective. What we didn't want to do was to give a long list of requirements for, for that to be fed into a legal document, for that to be then sent to a third party. The third party looks through this and says, you know what, these 10 issues regarding, say, on-premise work isn't relevant, let's cross these out. So this would then go back to the legal, to, legal department and the legal department would say, you know what, these guys have like scrubbed all these issues, is that okay? So what, what you had originally was this backwards and forwards between the legal and the security teams sort of internally, and then the legal departments, you know, talking to other organizations' legal departments. So the idea was that we wanted to literally add value, stop wasting time, actually focus on key things that were being sort of delivered by key organizations. and. You know, if, if, if it was that a particular organization was writing software and hosting, well, we'll just give them the requirements to write software and hosting. So we focused on sort of the easy buckets and, um, you know, all the stuff around like on-premise work in terms of bring your own device, um, connecting to your corporate network, organizations that are providing like remote support in terms of like, um, you know, bug fixing and development sort of fixing. This is all sort of fairly sort of straightforward. So, from a, you know, from a sort of a, an overhead perspective uh, from, from security, we just saw this as fairly sort of vanilla, fairly sort of straightforward, and trying to sort of affect change here. Actually, this was straightforward stuff. Similarly, the stuff around hosting. Now, a couple of years ago, so, Actually, many years ago, I was formerly a member of the security team of, of EggBank, and we were sort of this online uh, bank in the UK. We had no stores, everything was done online, and all of a sudden we had three million customers. And we had a requirement whereby we needed a vendor to some, you know, that, that needed to host some stuff for us. So we marched five vendors in, and they all proposed the same sort of thing. So you know, trying to make a difference, and this is what we're about, is, is making a difference and affecting change. We couldn't really do that effectively with hosting organizations. Um, you know, if someone is 27,001 and has a half decent sort of security policy, trying to affect change there where, you know, you may only have a couple of days looking at a particular event, you're not actually gonna do much. Like five years after sort of Ergo was at BAA and, um, we were sort of outsourcing our, our sort of dot com website to a vendor. And we had re responses from like 23 vendors. And these 23 vendors, with the exception of one, all proposed the same sort of network sort of security stack. So the question was, well, why are we spending like security time on hosting organizations that in effect, we can't really affect change? But what we found was from a, a development perspective, uh, this came out to be pretty important because there was more opportunity for, for sort of vendors to, to screw up and there was more, de uh, more demand for, for actual sort of expertise. So this, in effect, became sort of our focus and what we did to support that was to invest in tools, 
invest in sort of good people to run those tools and to focus on vendors sort of output from an SDLC perspective. So if someone wants to write code, we're interested in terms of what they do from a static code analysis perspective. We're interested in terms of what they're doing from a unit testing perspective. So we're not just looking at like code review that we'd undertake to ourselves, but we'd be looking for code reviews undertaken by the vendor themselves. And the key thing there is the cost fees sort of remediation. So, you know, I've had examples where we've found a load of bugs um, uh, as part of a, a dot-com launch. And um, these issues take time to fix. So if you found some critical SQL injection bugs and you're reporting back to a third-party development house to say, you know what, you've got to fix these bugs. Actually, you know, we've had sort of feedback from these guys to say, you know what, uh, we can't fix these bugs because we're delivering functionality. And if we have to fix these bugs, you can't get the functionality you want on your website. So the idea of focusing on sort of security um, within software development actually became fairly sort of important for us. Uh, like the off-the-shelf products, and by that I mean like the Oracles, the IBMs, the Adobe's, Microsoft's of this world, uh, and a number of the software as a service sort of providers. Um, what we found that influencing these vendors was, was actually sort of quite, qu quite difficult. So um, when you buy you know, software from IBM or Adobe, in effect, you're having to sign up to sort of their sort of terms and conditions. Well, one of the important things that, you know, we looked at or we sort of discovered was actually responsible disclosure. So if you run the likes of HP Fortify and you're analyzing custom code that's being fed through that, actually as part of that build process, you're also feeding through uh, the underlying vendor's code. So if you're, if you're feeding through sort of IBM code, actually not only are you potentially picking up bugs in your own sort of custom code, you're also picking up bugs from an IBM or an Adobe perspective. And the question is, what do you do in those scenarios where you do find bugs? Um, and that's something that we'll, we'll sort of come on to sort of shortly. So how does it work, you know, in theory? So the idea was that we were gonna sort of define some example contract sort of language. So if you're doing software development, we'll focus specifically on so software development. We also, as, as part of our sort of interface into the legal teams, we also defined explanations why we wanted certain requirements. So if we wanted an organization to do static code analysis, we gave examples of why that was required from examples from like previous websites that we had live. So we would actually cite a vendor that we had live where we found cross-site scripting and SQL injection and say, we need this requirement because of what happened over here. And it's, you know, it's then sort of empowering sort of legal, or the legal teams as part of that contract negotiations with the vendor to say, you know what, unit testing or pen testing of your services or seeing the output of them is important for these reasons. So not only that, we were also sort of aiding and assisting legal to say, you know what, this is a good response from a vendor, this is a bad response from a vendor. And the key thing there was that what we wanted to get from legal is to literally red flag actual issues. So what we didn't want to do, where you've got a thousand sort of vendors, we didn't want them sort of jumping up and down every like two minutes to say, you know what, we've got a question here, what do you think, when actually in truth it wasn't really relevant. So we were sort of assisting the legal and procurement teams to say, you know what, we're interested in this stuff and when you see it, you flag it to us. So. Here's a couple of examples, so. Let me just stop and, and, and see if you can sort of just read through this for a second. So the idea is, you know, if you're a, you know, if you're a, you know, if you're a vendor on site doing stuff, actually, we'll give you a set of requirements around bring your own device. So we'll assist you, uh, you know, turning up on site to do stuff, and these are the requirements, and we get this, and so, pretty much you know, every contract for a vendor that rocks up on site. So Again, with someone who's you know, housing sort of infrastructure, 
Again, we have minimum requirements around what we do around sort of infrastructure. And again, it's fairly straightforward, very sort of vanilla. Some of this stuff, okay, bring your own devices like a buzz term and a sort of new word over the last couple of years. But some of this stuff is like 20 years old. And, and you know, a lot of this, remember that every time you go to, to start a new contract with a vendor, it's, it's a negotiation, right? So this is kind of what we bring to the table. This is you know, what, what our negotiators from our side are, are bringing to the table. And, and I think that the important thing that, that we've done is we've actually created this. Like, they, they didn't have this before. You know, they would just come in and, of course, the vendor of software, they know their stuff. They, ha they have all the right things to say. And this poor procurement person, even if they're an, an IT procurement person, you know, they can't tap dance around the, the vendor. You're not going to outdance the vendor. And this actually helps them because now they have something to, they, they bring to the table. And if the vendor wants to strike it out, we have to have a conversation. Again, you know, here, here's an example of some guidance notes to legal and procurement. So, someone's building a website, we've given some notes, and at the bottom there I've, I've sort of highlighted some recent examples. So these were actual live issues on websites that we had live uh, that we then sort of fixed and remediated against. And we use that, you know, for the legal department to then sort of go out and say, you know what, we want this as part of a particular contract because this is important, and it's important because things have tripped up or fallen over previously. And so you can see that, oh, sorry. Uh, you can see, you know, at the bottom there, 17,000 customer records were lost because this guy way back a few years ago did this really badly. So you know, when procurement, you know, if the vendor pushes back and says, you don't have to do these things, you know, the vendor doesn't want to sign up for this sort of thing, procurement can say, but you know, we've had real issues with this in the past, and that's the ammunition that they actually need. And, and the, the one and two, the, the, under the guidance there, you can also see, like, look, if, if somebody talks about referencing OWASP in the way that they build their software, referencing BSIM in the way that they build their software, you know, these are things you can look for. That doesn't mean, you know, ah, they said OWASP, good, they're, they're done. Um, but it's the kind of thing to look for to say, oh, these guys may actually know something here. You know, that, that's, that indicates towards a good response as opposed to the ones that don't mention any of this at all. So I guess in terms of people, it's uh, security, procurement, legal. And uh, you may say, well, you've got a thousand contracts and they're existing. And they may be sort of in flight for a year or a couple of years or even like five years that I've seen in sort of one case. But these are renewals on a, you know, a fairly sort of, uh, you know, regular basis. So we have dedicated meetings set up half an hour in the diary to chat with legal and procurement to say, what are we doing with certain vendors? Um, and it's at that point we can then sort of affect sort of change. So, okay, you may have a thousand live contracts and you may think, well, you know what, I can't, do anything with that particular vendor for, for sort of three years. Well, hey, you know, a thousand contracts aren't going to sort of expire in, in one go. You're going to have like this, you know, rolling thing where contracts expire and where you sort of continually sort of evolve, um, you know, security that goes into them. So how it works in practice. Yeah, yeah. So, so we'll sort of talk about how this actually shakes out. Um, you know, when you're really dealing, because in many ways that's the theory, right? We just explained to you the, the theory. We gave them some guidance. We, we hope that they can use it when the time comes. And, you know, we're hoping that this is going to achieve something for us. So let's talk about, you know, a couple of... Uh... Yeah, okay, so here's a couple of things that go wrong, right? Periodically we run into these vendors who, you know, they, they won't uh, share their stuff with you at all. Um, or if we find an issue in the code, we find an issue in, in what they've delivered, they say, no, 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 that's not, not a problem. And, you know, I get it. They, they, they want to avoid extra work. And a lot of times for us, that just means we go waste a bunch of time creating an exploit, creating some kind of proof of concept, some sort of demo. And in the end of all that effort, we're no smarter than we were before. We've just convinced them. So we try very hard to, you know, to persuade them without having to do the demos. But sometimes you have to. 
Uh, there's an there's a, you know, American expression up there, pick your hill to die on. You, know, the, you don't want to fight every battle as if it's the most important battle too. So there are those times when somebody says, you know, there's probably nothing we can do to fix this. And you say, you know what, all right, fine. Uh, we'll, you, we're just not going to fight on that one. And we'll spend our effort fighting on things that are really, really important. Sometimes the vendors, you know, try to say, well, maybe it does do that. Maybe the software does do that. But how about you just put a firewall rule in? You know, we'll whitelist some IP addresses. Or how about you put in a web app firewall? Or let's make a rule for this. And, you know, if we have actually put things into a contract, if we actually have some terms and conditions up front, we can say, no, no, remember, you agreed to fix the stuff. You didn't agree to have us go put something in front of your broken software. You agreed to actually fix the software. And so that's one of the behaviors we're trying to get away from. And then, of course, there's this whole you know, vulnerability as, as change request, right? We come to them and we show them, look, you did this wrong. You're giving up private data. You're not restricting access the way you're supposed to. And they come back and they say, oh, well, if you want us to change that behavior, then, okay, we will... Uh, we, we can change that. Just sign here on this change request and we'll schedule that for the future. And, and like Noel said earlier, sometimes that's actually causing them to delay delivery of features. And then, of course, there's the people who say, you know, ah, we're ISO 27001 compliant. You know, that's, that's all you need to know. We're secure. Right? And, and in many ways, that's like a builder comes to you to work on your house. And you say, so show me that you're a good builder. And he says, well, look at my house. I run my house really well. Right? Well, okay, but I need to know that you can build my house well. Right? ISO 27001 is like kind of how you run your IT and do you follow some best practices and, and security and so on. It isn't if you're building software, do you build software securely? So the, the BSIM, the Building Security and Maturity Model, that will measure how you put security into software. But ISO 27001 is much more like how do you run things. So that's where some of the bad behavior happens. And here's an actual example that we went through. And this is really fascinating. I, I happened to be uh, working for Noel at the time this came through, and it was really exciting to, to watch it play out. So we've got massive retail.com, right? We have a major, major online retail.com site. So you've got one vendor, they're hosting. So their whole job is just keep the machines running, keep the network flowing, keep the operating system up to date and patch. And, and they can run all the middleware, so get your, your platform and your Java and all that up to spec. And that's where their responsibility ends. And we have another vendor who's building code. They're writing the code. Because, you know, when you do a major retail site, nobody writes it from scratch. You know, you go get some middleware, but then you pay someone to make you a, a retail site. And so we have a development vendor and we have a hosting vendor. Now, of course, when we had our negotiations with the hosting vendor, we got them to agree to keep things patched and up to date and, and, and test your patches before you roll them out and all these wonderful things. And ironically, there are plenty of problems with the way the hosting vendor wanted to do that, and we never got to those problems, because we got to this problem instead, where they said, right, we're ready to, to do a patch this weekend, we want to do blah, 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 and the, the development vendor is saying, whoa, 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 whoa. You, you, you can't take those systems down, because we have to use those systems, and, and if you take the systems down, then you're going to delay our delivery, or you might patch something, and it might, that patch might break our code. Well, sure, but you have to run on you know, the latest and the, the secure platform. And so basically what was happening here was we had a hosting vendor who's trying to do the right thing, right? We obligated them to patch these systems and keep them up to date, and they're actually trying to do what we've told them to do, but we have a development vendor who's getting in the way and says you can't do that. So what was really interesting was the legal team from the hosting provider came to the retailers and said, you know what, you asked us to do this stuff, but we're telling you right now we're not going to. We are not going to adhere to those terms in the contract because your vendor, your development vendor won't let us. So if you want us to, to do this, you're going to have to step in and, and fix this. And that is layer 9 security, right? Lawyer over here talked to lawyer over there and said, you guys get your stuff together, fix this, sort it out, and let the patching happen. And so the best thing is that guys like Noel 
don't have to go over and fight that battle. They can go off and look at something else. They can spend their time searching for defects in code. They can spend their time testing software. They can do the things that they're really well qualified to do because lawyers are off fighting a security battle that we don't have to. Is this yeah, what you wanted to yeah, do? I, I, yeah, I guess that's the key thing. So, um, you know, that battle actually uh, became a legal problem as opposed to a security team problem to say, you know what, we need this stuff fixed. So. That was something that was actually taken care of. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of lessons learned, what do you want to look out for if you try to do this yourself? You know, one lesson that we learned is, uh, to go forward, one lesson we learned is you don't win every battle, right? So this is an actual marked up contract that we tried to do with a service provider where we came to them with the, the standard terms and conditions that we have for these sorts of service providers and said, here, this is what you're going to need to do if you're going to be our service provider. And, you know, obviously they've gone and redlined a bunch of stuff and they've changed the, the uh, changed some of the wording on things. And, you know, this is layer nine security happening. It's interesting at the top, there's this whole thing about, you know, if you're going to be a hosting provider for us, you're going to offer us this service, you're going to have to have that penetration tested, and we want to see the results of those tests and, and that kind of thing. And this particular vendor has said, there's some other contract somewhere that gives you some audit rights, and so we're not going to write a whole new thing here in this contract, we're just going to kind of refer to something else somewhere else. Okay. I mean, I guess that's kind of a C name record, but at layer nine, right? You know, it's just a, it's a, it's a dereference. Another lesson is, is quid pro quo. You guys recognize the, the film reference? Hey, there we go. There's somebody older than 25. Um, so yeah, we, the silence of the land, right? You gotta have the quid pro quo. And so here's the really fascinating thing. Remember those lawyers who fought a battle for us? You know, they went and like sorted out that whole hosting thing for us and we didn't have to do it? Well, we gave them something of value in return. Not exactly, you know, uh, it's not like tit for tat, right? But it's sometimes we produce things of value for them. So we were actually able to identify, I say we, it's Noel and his team, <laughs> identified, you know, a zero day vulnerability in some really important middleware that from a major vendor, this is all like brand name stuff that you would know. And you could do SQL injection to all sorts of major brand name high street retailers uh, because they're all using the same middleware and it was, it, was, it was pretty bad. And so we went to the vendor quietly, discreetly, didn't, you know, put it on bug track, we didn't put it on full disclosure, we didn't, you know, uh, shame anybody in public. And, and so they're working on a fix. But what it means is then we can go whisper to procurement, by the way, here's something we did for those guys this year. You know, we gave them this vulnerability that they didn't know they had, and they're now fixing it. And it means the procurement can sit across from the table this year and they say, right, so Mr. Big Vendor with that multi-million pound contract, you weren't thinking of charging us full price for that software, were you? And, and so you actually get to give them a tool that during the contract negotiations saves our firm money. We, we negotiated a lower rate on that contract for this year. And uh, yeah, I, I sort of call it a virtual bug bounty, right? Because they didn't pay us for the bug. It isn't that kind of thing. But in the, at the end of the day, we saved money. We negotiated the contract lower for the coming year because we had actually given the vendor of that middleware something of value. Hey, have a bug. This is a really good one. And you didn't pay anything for it. So that's a really useful thing. And then over you know, a few years, we're saving seven figures. Like That's how much procurement has been able to leverage the output of the security team. They have leveraged you know, millions of value out of the stuff the security team is doing. And they're doing that by renegotiating contracts or, or you know, using it as leverage against the vendors to make them reduce their rates when, when they're producing shoddy software. So the security team is in some sense paying for itself. So yeah, ch just to sort of jump in there. Um, you know, if you're, if you're sort of feeding through custom code through something like Fortify and it runs on a particular platform one of the things that we did uh, was we ran the vendor code through a, you know, a static code analysis tool. So 
In addition to sort of finding our own sort of custom code defects, we're also finding sort of underlying bugs from software vendors. And, um, you know, we weren't sort of, you know, horses about this. We could have said, you know what, we can release something on bu bug track. You know, we can get sort of the names sort of, you know, alongside sort of CVEs. Actually, you know what, we w went about things and, you know, we sort of view this about going about things in the right way to say, you know what, people write software and software breaks. So we had a, a, you know, a responsibility to sort of disclose some of these issues, um, you know, back to them. And, you know, at the time, we weren't looking for sort of any kind of sort of, um, you know, pat on the back from the vendors. We just thought, you know what, software breaks will is a, you know, a good citizen, we will sort of report this back to him. But sort of over time, we've been able to sort of leverage some of this stuff to say, you know what, in our next sort of contract negotiation with these guys, we found these issues and we saved them a whole load of, you know, time and money and bad press. Uh, and we're sort of using it in that way to, to sort of, in effect, leverage money off. Yep. So layer nine attack and defense, right? So what are the kind of attacks and what are the kind of defenses that you do at layer nine? Um, one of the kind of attacks, of course, uh, so I'm American, I use all these American um, uh, metaphors here. If anybody has ever heard, if you've ever actually heard of Lake Wobegon, that'll be funny. It's an obscure radio program in America, but they, they, where they talk about, you know, all the children are above average, right? And uh, all your vendors are going to say the same thing too, right? They're all going to say that their security is above average. Of course, it can't be. Half of them have to be below average, right? And so they're all going to say wonder they're wonderful. And you're going to have to spot check it with your own due diligence, right? So you are going to have to go through and people will say, oh, of course we're secure. Of course, everything, we're, all our security is above average. Great. You let, and, and with some of them, you just have to spot check. And, you know, people who you spot check and they turn out okay a few times, maybe you spend a little less effort on them and the guys that you spot check and they turn out bad, well, you spend more effort on them. They're not going to share artifacts willingly. You know, no vendor wants to, to show off their dirty laundry, right? And in fact, we had the one vendor, right? They, you have to understand that a major online retail site, it's not like, you know, whatever.com and all the code runs on one server. It's not how any of this stuff works. And so you have vendors who are doing your uh, product reviews. And you have vendors that are you know, content distribution networks who are sending out the images. And you have all these different hooks and all these different services come together to deliver one retail experience. And so one of these guys, you know, they're, they're coming along and they're saying, you know, right, we're secure. You don't need to do anything. And then what you guys found just you know, all kinds of obnoxious, just alert one, just cross-site scripting all over. Do you want to pick up the, the story and finish that off? Yeah, so, you know, Thunder, uh, we ran what's known as an application vulnerability assessment and found a load of sort of basic security 101 sort of defects and sort of fed back, you know, literally fed that back to them. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was, you know, a, a pen test is effectively a triage exercise. It is something that happens late in the day. And um, the output of the pen test is literally, it literally tells you how bad you're bleeding. What it doesn't do is it doesn't tell you if there's something fundament, f fundamental that, that's broken or, or an issue that's sort of underlying to that sort of system. So, you know, we kind of sort of augment, you know, sort of security and penetration testing with things like static code analysis, with things like architectural sort of assessment, so we can actually get under the, the hood of how a, a product sort of works and operates. Just relying solely on sort of a, a penetration test actually is, is, you know, of limited value. So we got into discussions with this particular vendor to say, you know what, um, how about you sort of import our code into something like HP Fortify? And um, there was a great re reluctance from them to do that. And one of the things that we're coming back with was, well, we do that anyway. And it's like, okay, so which static code analysis tool do you use? Uh, and the vendor is like, oh, well, um, we use Fortify. Oh, and by the way, we use Vericode. Okay, so you've got some basic cross-site scripting vulnerabilities within your platform. 
and he used both Fortify and he used Veracode. Um, you know, ha ha how has that sort of happened? And uh, we said, well, you know, can we see sort of the output of um, Fortify? And one of the things that they came back with was to say, you know what, if we were to hand over this so-called Fortify report that we knew didn't exist, um, it was, you know, in breach of their sort of own sort of security policy. And I think that's the issue, you know, um, we want to sort of work with vendors and, 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 and support them. And, um, you know, we, we've been doing this for, well, I've been doing this for sort of several years, and I, I think a key message is, you know, if, if a security team works with a vendor rather than against, actually it's a win-win, and the vendor actually, from a security perspective, actually gets a better product, and that better product they can serve other customers. Mm -hmm. uh, and the win for ourselves is actually, you know, we, we've perhaps pulled something out from the vendor that potentially we can get money off. Yeah, so that, you know, that sharing data with you is against our security policy. You know, that's a, that's a layer nine, you know, thing that we have to dodge. And so that's when you send the layer nine people and you send the lawyers and like, they say that's against their policy. Why don't you guys write some really long documents and say it's okay to share? You know, that's a, it's a sort of layer nine attack and defense. And Noel's exactly right. It's win-win, right? Vendors get better software because we're sharing what we find with them. We're safer because these bugs get um, these bugs get squashed, and we might even save a bit of money on it uh, you know, as a side effect. So, lastly, if you're going to do it yourself, I mean, this is the sort of if there has to be any sort of subtitle for this entire talk, you know, it's it's this: we're from security, and we're here to help. Right, that's the, that's the thing. We're not the department of no, we're the department of yes if. Yes, if we do it this way. Yes, if you just do it this way, it'll be fine. Right, so if you're gonna do it yourself, first thing you gotta do is figure out your vendor landscape. We needed six buckets because we have six, you know, we have like thousands of, of vendors. You may have only six vendors. You know, if you're at a smallish enterprise, you may only have a handful of vendors doing a few things. You don't have to do buckets. Uh, if you get you know up into the sort of dozens, yeah, you're going to need some buckets. Categorize your vendors and and try to make the terms, uh, the the terms and conditions and the the contractual suggestions that you're bringing to the table, make them relevant to the different buckets. I mean, that's one of the things that they that, that prompted the buckets in the first place was that. You'd, you'd go to somebody who's building software for you and you bring this whole long list of you know, terms and conditions for hosting and they're like, we're not doing that. Take that stuff out of our, you know, so, so the buckets help you kind of pre-filter and only deliver the, the things that they need to see. And finally, you know, entice your procurement people. I mean, because obviously they're going to say, well, what's in it for us? And, and the answer is actually if we do this kind of security and we're feeding you information about this uh, the, the software and the products and the services that you're buying, then you, Mr. Procurement person, can use that in your day job to negotiate a better price. Because in many ways, that's an, one of the most important duties of a procurement person. And so that's, you know, that's the quid pro quo. That's we are giving you something of value, and you'll get to do your job better as a result. So that's really a high level of the whole thing. Um, you know, the... We want to be the, the security guys with the yes button, not, not the security guys with the no button. We've got a bit of time. Um, anybody have questions? Anything we want us to elaborate on? Hey. Um, you, you define very clearly uh, the setup of, uh, of the contractual and the procurement feast. But uh, what I'm afraid also, because we are defining this in, uh, in our company, is about the, the check and the act phase. So after the contract is signed, how do you get insurance that what has been defined in a contract is effectively applied? Because uh, a contract is just there in case of, and nobody wants to go in court with it. Right, yeah. So how do we, um, inf how do we know that they're actually delivering it? Well, I mean, no, that's what your team does, right? I mean... They're doing the assurance work. They're doing the penetration tests. They're doing the code reviews. They're doing. They're they're checking the software that comes in, and so all we're doing. We, 
I think we, a lot of us do this anyway, is we check software as we buy it, we check it for security vulnerabilities and so on. The, the piece we're adding here is teeth in the contract. Where before you would say, we found a bug, and they'd say, yes, yeah, so? And now we say, we found a bug, and this part of the contract says you have to fix that. How the enforcement goes, well, I mean, maybe you can tell the, the, other, the, the tail end of the resolution of the, the hosting providers, you know, and, and, and how that all, because that, that's kind of what it is, right? The assurance that it really got carried out. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, you know, it's pop, you know your security team, um, I mean, we're, we're sort of fortunate that, you know, we've invested in, in tools and sort of good guys. And, uh, you know, w when you sign up to anything sort of contractually, actually, uh, it's part of our job or the security team's job to actually sort of validate what has been sort of delivered. So if you're going live with a particular project or product or whatever, actually, as part of that assurance, as back, you know, as, as part of that assurance piece, um, you want to sort of validate in terms of what is being delivered is being sort of delivered, so to speak. Matthias? Oh, there we go. Hi, so I really like the approach with uh, quid pro quo with uh, procurement, but you were talking about only doing it with uh, bugs that you discovered. Why couldn't you leverage bugs that have been discovered by other people as well to negotiate down. So get, enabling procurement to actually know about other bugs and say, look, you know, ABC vendor had a massive vulnerability in the year since we've had it. And by the way, the cost of, of fixing this thing for, uh, for our organization was $50,000. Know, and they're asking us to pay $100,000. Um, know, we, should, we should negotiate hard on that. Just because you discover the vulnerability doesn't mean that um, you're, mean that yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's a, that's a really great idea, and, and it's actually one we haven't even thought of yet, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, so you get that, right? About, you know, so. and I, I think the thing is we found these bugs, and we're just like, holy crap, look what we found, and so there's obvious value. But you're, you're absolutely right. You know, if, if there's some major vulnerabilities that are being announced worldwide and publicly, even if we didn't find them, yeah, we could start leveraging that in the purchasing cycle. But, but I think you're right, the IT security guys still have that role to play where they have to find the ones that are really important and they have to know that actually, yeah, this was in software we really depend on and, and, and that matters. Hey, um, great talk, Paco and, and Nul. Uh, thanks. So uh, my question is, uh, in the contract you're, you're saying like, hey, you you have to do static analysis, you have to do this, you have to do that. Why are you not taking an opposite approach and say, hey, show me that you're doing static analysis. Uh, give me the evidence that you did a pen test and that you resolved the issues. I don't know that we don't do that. I don't know that we don't collect okay, the because artifacts. The Some I, of them won't share it, right? That was one of the, the problems. Yeah. Is but so if it's in the contract, they, they by default, they should share it with you. Yeah, and, and I, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 in some sense, I guess we just, we're going to do the assurance work ourselves anyways. Like, we're not going to take their word for it. But, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. Yeah, we could. And I think for some of these vendors that we trust and for some of the vendors that seem like they've got it going on, they, they know what they're doing, then, yeah, we can get it from them. We can get their information. We can look it over and say, yeah, you guys are on the right track. I guess, I guess this is you know, an important point. I mean, you know, we look at sort of software that's used sort of all over the world. And um, only last week, one of the guys in our, uh, in our team um, had the ability to sort of change video content on Barclay Card. Um, and that was something that was, you know, found within our security team that we report back to the vendor. So. You know, as, as part of those negotiations, sort of next time, that's something that we're, we're certainly going to sort of use and leverage. So, you know, it's quite straightforward. You know, you can sort of report these on CVE and perhaps get, you know, your sort of name up and lights, but actually the, the value that we see is actually sort of working with those vendors to say, you know what, we found stuff and we've helped you out, but at the same time, we, fa we found stuff out. Actually, we'd like, you know, effectively a little break on the price. Okay, so that concludes our time slot. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you, thank you very much.